Welcome once again to BipolarCast. This is a podcast where myself and Matt Bazicki speak to people with bipolar disorder using metabolic therapies, and we speak to scientists and experts in this field. Um, today, we're super excited to be speaking to Dan Harwood. Uh, Dan graduated with a degree in English and American Literature from the University of California at Santa Cruz. She's been a freelance writer for over two decades. In 2007, after a second baby was born, Dan was diagnosed with postpartum bipolar type 1 disorder. Two years later, Dan founded the Santa Cruz County chapter of the Depression Bipolar Support Alliance, where she's f- facilitated free group support groups for women with mood disorders for seven years. Dan's memoir, Birth of a New Brain, Healing from Postpartum Bipolar Disorder, is the first book to cover this form of bipolar disorder. Kay Redfield Jamison, author of the best-selling book, An Unquiet Mind, endorsed Dan's book and called it a gripping account of the awful juxtaposition of childbirth and the onset of bipolar illness. Her book is an informative and important contribution to our understanding of, of, tri- of what triggers mental illness and that this happens more often than is generally recognised. Dan has practiced a well-formulated vegan ketogenic diet for the past eight months under the guidance of nutritionist Denise Potter of Advanced Ketogenic Therapies. Dan is a member of the Vegan Society Researcher Network, and she became a vegan late in life at age 47. She lives in the Santa Cruz Mountains of California with her husband of 22 years, their two teen daughters, and their Scottish collie. We're always happy to hear about Scottish things uh, on the show. That's right. Thank, thank you for joining <laughs> us. Thank you so much. I am so happy to be here that I'm going to have to try to tone it down, but it's it's not mania. It's it's a grounded happiness we, we were just saying before we started the podcast how like if you get enthusiastic about something in a normal way you know people you're always worried people are going to think you're a but it's a it's a constant battle we've had we've had yeah. honestly the most safe, uh, sane and stable people I ever meet are probably on this podcast we're very the, the outside world is much more uh well than anything we encounter here so we're uh, please don't worry about that at all and uh, it's just fantastic okay. to have you and uh so and we've been hearing um so much about um so I first uh, you'd got in touch um and you would mentioned your book which is absolutely amazing uh and it's endorsed by Kay Redfield Jameson who's uh, obviously a legendary uh, psychiatrist uh, that works on bipolar disorder research um so um could you could you tell us a little bit about that and your story with that book it was and and how that came about oh sure um well I think I'll I, if you don't if you guys don't mind I'm gonna back up since we're all um musicians or wannabe musicians here uh I I basically grew up with bipolar disorder because my dad who was a violinist with the LA Philharmonic had bipolar one disorder and I'll turn off my phone. That's a big no-no during podcasts. I know that. Um, <laughs> anyway, my dad had bipolar, and I always thought it wasn't going to happen to me. I, I, In fact, I even looked down on him in a way as much as I loved him because it was his great weakness, and it all, he almost lost his job um, numerous times in the orchestra because of it. Uh, a lot of other people in the in the orchestra, and I, I don't feel bad for saying this, a lot of them have bipolar disorder because a lot of musicians have bipolar disorder. So anyway, uh, I really didn't think I would ever get it, uh, but I had a few times where I got a little paranoid and I would ask him, you know, Dad, do you think I'm ever going to get this? Because I would see him, he'd, he'd go from being a Renaissance man and doing a million things like painting and photography, sailing, uh, just you name it, whatever, he, backpacking by himself in the Sierras, which wasn't the greatest idea. Um, but then, you know, he'd go to the opposite and he'd be in his bed all day and it was like a cave and it smelled bad. And the windows were closed, even though it was a beautiful, you know, Los Angeles morning, sunny. And I said, you know, dad, do you think I'll get this? And he'd always reassure me. And he said, you know, by even if you did get it, they're going to come up with a cure by then. So just don't worry about it. And I didn't. And when I was 16 years old, he was hospitalized again. And I took his, um, he didn't have his violin with him, which was like his right arm or his third arm. And um, I called him on the pay phone because in back then in the psych units, they just had pay phones and anyone would answer. And um, I asked for my dad and he came to the phone. I said, dad, do you want me to bring you your violin? And he said, yeah, that would be great. So I had just gotten my driver's license and I was 16 and I got in my Jetta got on Sunset Boulevard with his Stradivarius in the back seat and drove to UCLA and brought him his Stradivarius violin <laughs> and because I wanted to cheer him up. And I got um, I got my wrist slapped for that. But again, I just thought, um, you know, those people are different from me. And even though um, he's insanely talented, you know, he does have this cross to bear, this albatross. And I wouldn't want to be that talented and also have have to live with that. 
So I'll just be, be I'll just be mediocre. I just settled for mediocrity. And um, I didn't do very well in high school. And ironically enough, I went to the high, the same high school as Kay Redfield Jameson did for a while. And I, I found that out much later, but I thought that was really ironic. And um, I just, you know, I just kind of just flailed around. I didn't really know what I wanted to do in life, but I just, so I just, I, I thought I was a pretty good writer and I love to read. So I thought, okay, I'll do something in English. And I applied uh, to UC Santa Cruz and I got in. And I, I chose Santa Cruz because mainly because of a movie called The Lost Boys, which was about a bunch of vampires. And this movie was filmed here and it was so beautiful in Santa Cruz. I thought, you know, that's the place for me, you know, vampires and, and university. And I moved up here and uh, I had periodic depressions just due to life stuff, like, you know, bad breakups and things like that. And, but nothing, nothing bipolarish really. Uh, and that, then I had my first baby when I was 34. And at that point, I just flail. I was still flailing. I was doing like admin jobs at different cool nonprofits, but I hadn't really found my calling. And when I was 34, I had my first baby and I did start to get a little manic, but nobody caught it because I just, I was able to sleep and I was super happy because the birth went well. And so it kind of like, it's like a volcano and the magma started to come up a little bit, but then it came back down and it was like a false alarm. And then two and a half years later, I had my second baby, my second daughter. And this time the bipolar had been triggered for sure by the childbirth and I didn't sleep at all. And I was incredibly happy. And so at that time, there wasn't the awareness that they have now of, um, you know, postpartum mood disorders and stuff. And they just thought, everyone just thought I was happy. And they were a little concerned, but I wasn't doing anything too crazy yet. I wasn't doing the grandiose thinking yet. I wasn't, uh, you know, I was able to kind of to pass and get out of the hospital, you know, in the two days that they give you here. But that's when things really, can I curse on this? <laughs> I think I heard a couple people. There's, there's no limits. <laughs> Whatever you want. Um, the, the, I'll do it in French. The merit hit the fan. I got the weirdest symptom that a lot of people have experienced with bipolar, both men and women, but they don't realize what it is exactly. And it, it's called hypergraphia. And hypergraphia is uncontrolled writing. And you'll write on anything. You'll write on any surface. You'll write on yourself. You'll write on mirrors. You'll write on just anything. I, the good news is I didn't write on my babies as I was breastfeeding them. But apart from that, anything was game. And I did have enough. I wasn't psychotic. And I did think, like, this is really weird. You know, something's not right with this. And my husband would hide my laptop because he, he knew something was up, too. But it wasn't at a crisis point yet. Uh, so I Googled and I did, you know, nonstop writing for, and my wrist, meanwhile, was like hurting so bad. Like I, I had like the worst carpal tunnel, but I just kept going writing and um, I Googled it. And this woman came up, her name um, is Dr. Alice Weaver Flaherty. And she wrote a book called The Midnight Disease. And in it, she discusses hypergraphia and how she had it too. And I was like, oh my God, you know, I want to find out, you know, what's going on. Cause everyone was kind of out of it. And so I was actually able to call her office and she talked to me for free and she was very serious, like deadly serious. And she's like, you need to get checked out. Uh, Cause I was being a little bit jokey with her and she's like, this is serious. Get checked out. I, you know, this, this sounds like a mood disorder, but of course she's not going to diagnose me over the phone. And then that's, that's, that's when the mood tsunami began just the, the years and years of psych, uh, hospitalizations, the, you know, 30 plus medications. Um, and my first hospitalization when I was manic, right, when my, I had a baby and a two-year-old, uh, I used that payphone to call my dad. And my dad picked up the phone and I said, dad, I've been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And he started to cry. And it was one of the worst things ever, but I was manic. So I was like, you know, don't worry. It's everything's good. You know, I'll be fine. But he felt responsible. And then what really sent me over the edge into like total suicidal ideation and stuff was when he died. And because he had always been my rock. Um, and 
when I found out that he died, I felt suicidal. And my wonderful, amazing husband who got me through this uh, took me to one of the local hospitals and I asked for ECT because I felt like it was my last resort. And I, I didn't want to do it because my dad had had ECT done and it just it didn't do anything bad to him, but it just didn't do anything to help him. But I was just like, you know, it's either that or, or I, you know, that's it. I'm, I'm out of here. And I had it done and it totally I don't want to sound like a poster child for ECT because I don't want anyone to have to have it. But if you're at that point, it totally saved my life. And I actually didn't have anything really bad happen, you know. I mean, you could argue that if I had memory loss, how would I know? But I was able to write a, a 250 page book after having ECT and no one else wrote it for me. <laughs> no one wrote this book for me. And that just shows the brain, our brains are resilient and they can go through a lot, a lot more than we think they can go through. Yeah, they're not perfect, but so um, I would do the ECT again in a heartbeat if I, but although now there's you and I, the three of us are going to talk about other options, right? Because, you know, little did I know there were other options back, you know, in store. But I had the ECDT done. I finally found a great psychologist, psychiatrist who figured out he, he was kind of getting exasperated too, because I had tried so many meds and nothing worked. Um, I've heard both of you talk to people about their medication experiences and like a lot of people said they just felt like a zombie like it just kept them kind of you know at this level instead of this or this but he I had been taking lithium the gold standard and just kind of like just still not not where I wanted to be at all and he said well why don't you try taking an MAOI and I was like are you crazy because my dad had taken one of those uh, monoamine oxidase in inhibitor and he, there's a lot of uh, food restrictions and scary things around it and all these myths that turns out they aren't true. And I remember my dad just was like pissed because well, he couldn't drink, although I don't drink. He couldn't have like some of his favorite foods like grapefruit and stuff. And he just, he just was not into it. But with me, um, combining the MAOI with lithium lifted my treatment resistant bipolar depression in three days after years and years of just feeling like crap. And so I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it, you know? And so I'm, I'm still taking it. Um, that was in 2013. So I've been doing this for thir for 10 years, lithium and the MAOI. And I'm at a very low dose of the lithium now. I'm, I'm still in the therapeutic range, but um, I would like to be able to reduce that over time but I'm not going to do it yet. <laughs> okay. Is that enough of an intro, you guys? <laughs> wow. You want me to this, sing this, now? No, that's a good intro. So, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's an amazing intro. We can finish the podcast. That was so interesting and epic. I mean, the, um, that was so interesting. And um, and so I, I can tell you're a writer because it was so well explained as well. It was, um, yeah, I, I think um, there's so many things you could pick up on. I mean, one that springs to mind is um, just uh, music, <clears throat> because so many people with bipolar turn to music. And um, it seems to be something that, you know, if you're on any bipolar forum, people are sharing songs like in our bipolar uh, Scotland um, support group we have here in Scotland. People share playlists for like different mood states. So it's like if you're manic, here's some oh, songs. You're, if you're depressed, here's some songs. And <clears throat> people do seem to really resonate with it and I've certainly felt that myself what why, do you have any thoughts about why that is like why is music such a massive thing for people with with bipolar are you asking Matt or me <laughs> uh, both both actually but you what do you first. think Matt oh okay, I'll okay. Go. I think, <laughs> you go <laughs> um I'm sure there's some um architecture in the brain that has to do with the proclivity for music that also has to do with the illness I, I'm sure that the uh, emotional states that music can induce, the highs and the lows of music, can mirror the brain of a person with bipolar. And so someone who is bipolar, naturally more inclined to music, or someone who's, you know, inclined to music is more likely to have bipolar. I have no idea. But, you know, I, I just think there's the, the a, a person with a bipolar brain that is capable of accelerating to those, those those highs and those lows as well 
is just more likely to um, gravitate towards music because it kind of brings out the same, some of the similar, uh, similar moods. So, I mean, mm -hmm. for me, and then, but so I, I think there's that, but then the second thing I'll say is that for me, getting stable has in no way hindered my ability to make music, enjoy music, obsess about music. Mm -hmm. um, if anything, I'm, I'm more obsessive because I'm able to consistently put in work on projects and piano and learning and all this stuff. So um, I, you know, getting stable, I lost none of my love for music, none of my ability. I think there's a manic brilliance, but I think there's also a brilliance in just being stable and being able to do it consistently and be able to work out, work on projects and things like that. Hmm. That's awesome. I can, how can I go after that, that he said exactly what I was thinking? <laughs> No, uh, but, yeah, but does, that no, right. with your, does that resonate oh, yeah. with your experience and with your father's, you, with living with your father? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I do, I have written songs and I, ha I used to play guitar and my husband, um, he's a geologist by day, but he's a wonderful guitarist by night and he uh, restores vintage Martin guitars. So when we were evacuated, this Matt, you'll find this funny, especially mm. we were evacuated due to these horrible fires that were going on, the CZU yeah. fire complex. Of course, Craig was like, get the guitars. <laughs> yeah. so important. Yeah. We, can't, we can't let them burn. I heard one guy's house burned down and he had like 30 guitars in it. But anyway, oh. that's a slight discretion digression. Um, was it the guitars so anyway, first I, or the I, Scot was it the guitars first or the Scotty dog? That's what I'm wondering. Oh, it was the dog. <laughs> well, okay. we took we took two cars. <laughs> okay. But I am a frustrated musician. I always felt like if I if someone said, Diane, you could do whatever you want, um, it wouldn't be a writer. It would be, I mean, do it really, really well. I would love to be a singer, a really amazing singer, guitarist. Um, so I think there's a part of my brain that is stifled. Uh, and I think it's like you said, it's um, it's just really common. It, there's got to be some part of the brain, the synapses that are connected with music and with the, with the other mm. parts that cause cause the manias and the depressions. You know, speaking of writing, do you have a lot of the writing you did over the years when you're manic when you were going through this? And do you have you looked at it at all? Yeah, that's funny. You read my mind because I was actually going to say about the hypergraphia time when I was doing all the crazy writing. I thought I was writing such profound and brilliant things. And when I looked mm -hmm. back at that, you can and this is very true with everyone, most everyone who goes through this, you look and it's like chicken scratch, like it does, you can't even make sense of it. And it's so heartbreaking in, in a way because you really were, you know, on a different level. And I'm not it wasn't psychotic, but it was definitely a different level. Uh and so it was, it was hard. I mean, I'm sure there's some people out there in that state who can write things that make sense. And you could argue that that would be interesting to find people. Do you think yeah. when you were in these states, cause I had a similar thing. I did a lot of writing, although maybe not as obsessively, but I do have some of my journals. <laughs> do you think you were having realizations that were profound and did make sense to you in the state you were in, or was it just nonsense that you took for some sort of profound realization? I really do think it was it was real and it, they mm. were insights yeah. uh, and it's it's hard because I've had people tell me since then they thought I was being acting psychotic they actually used that word and I wanted to show you everyone not just you but all the listeners out there um this these are my hospital notes I don't know if you can see how many notes are and that's just from one hospital stay and mm. not once not once the reason I show you that is that no one ever said use the word psychotic with me, which is very interesting because I've had people kind of like negate what I've gone through and use different diagnoses to my face. And that's been kind of, that's been hard um, to deal with. But so to answer your question though, Matt, I really do feel like they were profound without sounding like I have my head blown up too, too much. And I wish I could tap into it and, and get those back, get those in, in a way that I could read them to myself or to other people, share them. Yeah, you know, it's similar yeah. for me. I had so many episodes, psychotic episodes where I was writing stuff and it made perfect sense to me. When looking back, some of the things like the idea that I was a reincarnation of some famous person, just obviously a delusion, but some of it really made sense to me in the moment. You know, it made mm -hmm, profound mm -hmm. sense to me in the moment. But I want to skip forward, Ian, 
sure. that's okay to the keto. And because I'm so oh, curious God. about how you found <laughs> keto, how you started it and about um, doing vegan keto and the challenges and how that's been. I'm so curious. Okay. I'm, I'm so like, so into talking about this now. Like my family is like, shut up. Don't, yeah. they had, yeah. no, if I start to say the word keto, they, we have a safe word now. <laughs> I think it, the latest one is lemon. If they say, if my, my daughters say lemon, I have to stop talking about it. <laughs> You'll go through this someday, Ian, with your children. <laughs> I, I, literally just before we came on the podcast, uh, my wife Becky was saying, should I make you some cookies, Sky? That's my daughter's name. And she's like, can we do keto oh. for daddy? She, she knows, like she knows. So, yeah, to, so uh, oh, it's, yeah. Oh, good. So, no, Maybe please, you... pl- please tell us the story of, of the Okay, okay. I'm super interested. Okay. Okay. Well, um, basically five years ago, I broke my jaw because I was walking. I was re- I'm really into exercise and I was walking, looking at my cell phone, texting, and I didn't see there was a, I was in a tennis court. I was walking across the tennis court with my Scottish collie and I didn't see there was a tennis net on the ground and I tripped and fell flat on my face. Oh. And this, don't worry, this is connected to the story. <laughs> so I, um, everything worked out fine. The jaw is fine. But, and so this is a lesson. Don't look at your cell phone while you're walking, everybody. And I was, I had a lot of downtime just recovering. And I watched a movie called What the Health, just on a whim, because I had heard someone in Santa Cruz was a co-producer. And I just, I just was really bored. And I was looking at Netflix one night and the movie, I won't go into detail, but I had been a total carnivore my whole life. My dad like used to cook rabbit in the house and stuff and huge meat fan. And I always, I just had it all the time. But that evening I watched this movie and there's a few scenes in there that just completely changed my life. That's all it is. And I went overnight from being a meat eater to a vegan. And so that's how I started that. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty, it's still to me, it's an extreme way to be. And um, I'm, I don't come, even though I live in Santa Cruz, which is kind of like a Mecca for like healthy living. And a few of the big vegan people are, live here, like John Robbins and people like that. It's still not the norm. It's not like, you're not going to come across a bunch of vegans all the time. Great. But still moving on. So five years later, I started to get this thing called perimenopause. And I like went from having a kind of a flat stomach to like this alien, I called it my alien baby. Like I had this huge stomach and it was really embarrassing. And every day I would wake up and I just felt gross. And I asked a friend of mine, like, what was she doing to lose weight? Cause I had done it all. Um, I, I, I used to be a certified personal trainer a long time ago, and I've always been into fitness and nothing was really budging this. And she said, I've been doing keto and it's been going really well. And I thought it was like that trend, you know, I've heard about it as a trend and I had really negative connotations with the word, like it just triggered like, Ugh. but I was pretty desperate to get rid of this belly because I didn't even drink beer or anything. So I decided to just try it. And I had no idea what I was doing at all. And in fact, I wanted to, if it's okay with you guys, I wanted to share my three mistakes that I made because yes. I, I totally, totally blew it. Um, especially as a vegan, you know, I blew, I just, I just jumped in head first without researching it properly. Um, but even, even by making mistakes at the beginning, it was wonderful. It was amazing and validating. And I had to keep a lid on my feelings because I didn't want to seem like I was manic. But the irony is that I know, I know, Pat, Matt, I know that that look. The irony is that I did become hypomanic, but just for a few days at the beginning. But it's kind of a slippery slope because when I started it, it was at the equinox, the fall equinox. And yeah. traditionally for me, that's my, one of my favorite times of the year. And it's hard to tell if it was a combination of things, the equinox and the keto or just one or the other. So I like to, I like, I, I think it was both. Does that make sense at all? Or mm-hmm. so, um, so, okay, where am I missed? I even wrote this down. Uh, so I, I know you two have had uh, Dr. Georgia Ede on and she's amazing. She's one of my, every, everyone you've had on is amazing, but she's particularly amazing. And she emphasizes how you should get your blood levels done before you start. And I didn't do that. I did run it by my psychiatrist who I love, but he didn't know about the keto diet at all. But he just, he, it sounded kind of harmless to him. So he said, okay, you know, do your research. Um, I didn't, 
I didn't uh, make sure I had enough electrolytes. So I didn't have an, the keto flu at all, but looking back, I totally should have made sure I did that. I did have a headache for a couple of days and I started drinking some salt water and it got better, but you know, that's not a good idea. And then uh, oh, my third, my third mistake is like what I'm saying, like mistaking hypomania for change in seasons only. I think if you have bipolar, you, you have to just be extra cautious. And I do have an emergency bottle of Zyprexa in the closet in case I start feeling that hypomania come on. I've only used it one, maybe three times in the past 10 years um, due to just not sleeping at all, uh, due to like excitement. Like I was at a writer's conference and I was up all night and it started to trigger it. So if I take just one pill, it just brings me down right away. So does yeah, that answer the, it kind of? Yeah, <laughs> the, it's so it's the, so funny. I also have Zyprex that I keep on my keychain with me when I'm driving ooh. and at home that I had to take recently because I flew west to east and got really messed up because of the time change. Um, did you, yeah. what was it like dealing with the initial, you said you thought you thought you got hypomanic when you started the diet. What was that like yeah. and how did you come down and how did you adjust? I honestly, I just get sound out there, but I kind of felt like I was falling in love. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? I just felt, I, you know why? I felt like I was taking charge and I felt empowered. I finally felt like, whoa, this, I started to find a whole new field at my fingertips of something that could totally help this, you know, bipolar disorder. I had no idea it existed, you know, at all. And nobody told me about this. It was just all serendipitous. Uh, and so the more I dug, the more I found, I discovered, you know, Dr. Chris Palmer, I discovered your amazing bipolar cast that I listened to every day in the Redwoods that just inspired me so much and validated everything. And uh, I found like all these, you know, you know, not to mention the Charlie Foundation, the hundred, hundred plus years of research done uh, on epilepsy that is very similar to bipolar, right? I've taken all those epilepsy drugs. I've taken them all. And um, it just, it all seemed to make sense and come together. So, and, and the best, one of the best things, and I'll just say it because I remember Ian, you talked about how you got into keto and you said you felt overweight and it was bumming you out. My stomach totally disappeared. And I was like, that's crazy, you know, not to the point of unhealthy, you know, I'm never going to, I don't want to be unhealthy, but it was so nice to have that just go away. It just, it was weighing me down literally and figuratively, you know. The, the hypomania when you're adjusting to the diet is really commonly reported. We did this um, online uh, survey. Uh, well, this, it was an analysis of online posts in like bipolar forums and lots of people report this. And we've heard it from Chris Palmer with his patients. And we've heard it from a lot of practitioners that use it. It's really common the first three days. <clears throat> and we've actually got some interesting data still to uh, release about this this summer but the um it, it's really uh common but it but then it seems to stabilize and people after sort of two to three days of this uh, stabilize out into uh, improved moods and and they become more stable than they were before but it's just getting through that first two to three days and i spoke to mm -hmm. denise potter and beth zupek about uh at this uh, metabolic mind retreat that we had in uh, florida that matt and i were at a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. and they were saying that this can be managed through various means, and they found ways to uh, do this with epilepsy and so forth. So it's mm -hmm. it's really uh, you know it's not it's actually a sign that something is changing in the brain. I think it's something right. that's, and then we can research that and understand about it. So, um, what was your experience like then um, transitioning through that phase into established ketosis? Um, how, what was your, what what benefits made you want to stay on this diet that you noticed after this uh, this transitional phase? Well, up, up to that point, I started doing this thing where I was, had to take a nap every afternoon and I just felt this sinking fatigue. And I was like, what? I have two teenagers. I, you know, I have my dog, my husband, <laughs> poor guy. Um, and I was like, I can't, this is, this is not cool. I don't want to be having to take a nap. Well, as soon as I started doing the, the vegan keto diet, the naps, I didn't need to take the naps anymore. And I still don't. And that's huge. I've been doing this for eight months. But I still felt like, I mean, I, I know I didn't totally answer your question before. Like, I mean, I definitely came off of that, that kind of high, the hypomania. And then, and then just, you know, I did kind of stabilize. I did. Um, I just was excited to, to just find this 
whole, it was a whole new world. I'm going to sound like a Barbie song or something or <laughs> a little, what's it called? The Little Mermaid, whatever. Uh, and I also decided I felt better so that I could exercise more regularly. So it was kind of like this whole chain uh, domino effect that had, and, and, you know, it wasn't perfect. I wanted to, you know, make sure like, this is not, I don't want people to think that I'm sugarcoating this completely, but uh, like my sleep, I heard a lot of people say, oh, your sleep's going to get so much better. That didn't happen. Uh, and your moods are going to get a lot better. Well, my moods, they did get better, but they, I'm kind of a moody gal. I mean, I, my whole life before, be before bipolar, what is that? BB and after bipolar, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say. So, um, so I, I think that's just part of my life and part of having a family and having teenagers in the house. Uh, your mood's not going to be the greatest all the time especially with, with what, it, what they're going through this past year. But uh, did I answer the question completely or did you have? Yeah, uh, I'd be remiss having two young kids not to find out that a whole new world is Aladdin. That's, uh, that's an Aladdin song. <laughs> I'm, I'm constantly exposed to Disney films at the moment. So it was it. I have a question. This is the one yeah. that I've been wondering about the most. Yeah. What foods do you eat? What does your diet makeup look like? I knew you're going to ask me that, you know, last time, you know, as you guys know, I had to cancel last time because one of my daughters got sick, but for that podcast, I did like these cheat sheets. I did all kinds of stuff. And one of them was like, I know Matt's going to ask me what I eat because I watched mm. every single one and it's pretty limited. I'll be honest with you. And when I, I did meet with Denise Potter, the wonderful nutritionist of advanced ketogenic therapies. And I thought she was going to go off because I eat a lot of the same things every day. There's not a whole lot of variety. In the morning, I'll have a smoothie uh, with Sun Warrior protein powder. It's chocolate because I love chocolate. I'll throw in a bunch of MCT oil in there and chia seeds and um, what else? That's kind of it. So the, I have the same thing every morning. And my friend, Christine, she was like, God, I, I need something I can chew. I could never do that. And the thing is, if you soak the chia seeds, they're kind of chewy. And if you, uh, if you put in like cacao nibs, that's, it's even chewier. So you can work with a smoothie, but you know, I used to love scrambled eggs and stuff like that. So I do still have eggs, but they're vegan eggs and I have them for dinner and I'll have them with like an avocado and olives and I'll use, uh, you know, I'll have more MCT oil because, um, as I'd like to share with you guys, like Denise, Denise and I talked about doing an MCT oil heavy diet. Not uh, not 100% MCT according to the Char Charlie Foundation, but pretty close, pretty close. And I want to share with you, I'm doing. Hey, Matt, I am a vegan who loves fat. I love eating mm. fat. I love how it makes me feel. So I have I'm having about 84% fat a day, which translates into about 164 grams of fat a day. And a, the way I get there is through the MCT oil, which has a lot of healthy fats. And then. It's, it's hard. Like the protein, it's easy for me to get a lot of protein. Everyone's thinking, oh, vegans can't get enough protein, but I get it through, I eat a lot of uh, raw spinach and tofu and stuff like that. Uh, net carbs, the tricky one, I do 20 grams a day, which is really low, so sometimes less than that. I'm trying to get even lower, a lot lower than that. But that's hard. You know, I'm not going to lie, but I think that applies to both vegans and non-vegans about the, mm. you know, the net carb challenge. Um, I have oh also something that's really important is I, I don't go anywhere without, uh, I have these, these keto bars. There's one called the hungry Buddha vegan keto bar. They're really good. I'm always on the lookout for, you know, anything really good. That's, you know, vegan and low carb. It's that's my bar. So every day chocolate. <clears throat> So, so, one, so you'd mentioned about um, it having more energy in the afternoons, and this is something that we've, uh, in the bipolar research, we're trying to recognize this aspect of energy. There was a big study done by Andy Nuremberg recently who looked at over 500 bipolar patients, and he found that energy was the biggest predictor of either mania or depression. So if you reported increased energy, you're uh, predictive of mania, reduced energy and predictive depression, and it actually predicted almost all the other symptoms of bipolar very powerfully. So there's, there's something about, uh, and you can read this in lots of qualitative studies going back uh, through the last 10, 20 years of bipolar research. 
And so there's something about energy that I, I also, I very strongly relate to the need to nap in the afternoon. I used to sleep all the time in depression. It was just like so hard to even move or do any basic, even cleaning your teeth, like things that are like so basic it seems impossible that you wouldn't do that but I would literally get tooth decay because I couldn't clean I mean it's just you can't imagine that this is possible but it it is what catatonic depression is like so I I really relate to what you're saying with that and I've spoken to other people who've said the same thing they stop napping and when you um, talk about that kind of exhaustion and depression and compare it to how you are in ketosis what is the difference like For, for me it was very physical it felt like you're wearing a 200 pound suit and you know, you're, you're really not able to catch your breath. Whereas then in ketosis, I felt much freer and lighter, not just because of the weight changes and so forth, but because the actual energy it was, did you notice a dynamic mm. like that with a shift in your energy? Oh my God. Yes. Well, I, I, I'm kind of glassing over all the years with, with the terrible depressions that you described so well, Ian. Um, you know, I, I think one, one way to, that really sums it up is one time I was so depressed. I, I was in my bed as usual. And I had two dogs at the time. Uh, I had my housemate was helping me take care of them, I guess, because and I was just there. And one of them went up on my bed and like didn't did an amber herd. She she pooped on my bed with me in it, and I didn't even clean it up. I was too depressed to move. I mean, that's that's kind of a low a low point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I mean, uh, yeah. But um, you know, so with the with the, how it is now, just the ketosis. I mean, I get tired during the day. And one thing I neglected to tell you about what I eat is I do love coffee. I do know caffeine's not good, you know, for us in large amounts, but that's my one, um, what's the word I'm going to remember the weakness. (laughs) (laughs) It makes you feel better. I I don't don't want to say a sick amount of caffeine, but I do also love, 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 love caffeine. And oh, I talked to someone at the Metabolic Mind uh, retreat who said that there's research evidence that drinking caffeine or consuming caffeine can help accelerate um, you into ketosis. So Mm -hmm. I don't know. This this is what's uh, this is something that I've thought about extensively (laughs) that I think is so tricky about this is because this is so new and so novel. We haven't exactly we we haven't identified the variables and the the specific important each carries and the impact each carries. So I've don't go insane with the caffeine. You know, I like a couple coffees a day, but then yeah, there's also the new evidence that caffeine can accelerate um, your your um, your ketosis. So then I have to wonder, like, if I'm being told. Uh-huh. To not to drink caffeine. Well, could caffeine be helping me get into ketosis? Is that worth the effect, the negative effect it could have and the destabilization of my mood? The only thing that I found is trial and error. That's the only thing that I've found. Mm. And if I can drink 300 milligrams of caffeine or two to 300 milligrams, whatever it is, mm-hmm. and like be stable on that, then it's not a concern for me. So yeah, I don't know. I... I'm starting to trust my experience more and more when someone says, oh, you shouldn't drink, you know, 300 milligrams of caffeine a day. But if I can do this through the Equinox and be stable and sleep like mm-hmm. I did last mm-hmm. night and sleep every night, yeah. and I'm like sleeping perfectly. Then I'm like, well, oh. maybe we don't exactly know, you know, that's yeah. right. That's what it really has boiled down to for me. But then if I see some evidence of destabilization of my mood because of something I'm doing, you know, I've had it because I stayed up till one or two a.m. and suddenly my mood is mm. shot to shit. I'm like, well, I have to acknowledge mm-hmm. this is the this is the truth, right? I, I saw the right. study on that right. caffeine and ketosis, Probably. and yeah, and it, and it increases your metabolic rate, which increases your fat oxidation, so you can hmm. generate more ketones. And uh, but it, it's just a balance. I, I personally find caffeine beneficial, but I know for people that are you know more. Uh, on the mania side, it can be difficult, and mm. I'm more on the depressive side because of bipolar too. So, but it but it is a really interesting topic. Um, so I mean, I, I this energy thing keeps coming up again and again in the podcasts of people having reduced energy, and we're seeing it in our pilot trial that we're working on with participants, and we're actually oh, measuring in right. in real detail what changes in the body biochemically going through these states, which is really fascinating actually. And, and we'll be presenting these in June, uh, some of the insights from this. But um, in terms of uh, your, another thing people notice is one is energy during the day and another one is sleep at night. Um, did you notice any changes in sleep going into ketosis versus not in ketosis? 
Honestly, it's just been not that great, like the whole time before and since, although it's gotten a little better lately. So I, I'm still trying to figure out what to do with that because I would go work out for, I do a two hour hike and, you know, limit the caffeine, just have a little bit in the morning. I mean, a gnarly heart hike and stuff. And I still wouldn't, it wouldn't change my sleep. And in the past, before I had bipolar disorder triggered, if I did that, I would have slept like a baby. So I have to think, I have to wonder if it's my biochemistry, my medications, which I don't want to mess around with yet. I'm too, I've promised my husband who's been through total hell with me in this, with this illness. Like I told him, I'm not going to mess with my medications because that's been an issue. I do write about in the book at length and it almost split us up, you know, mm. um, but I am hoping that over time, you know, with the research and everything and the study, the, you know, randomized control trials and stuff, they'll be able to prove that we can lower our doses or even eradicate taking medications. That's one of my big hopes. And I know, Matt, you're working on that. You're both working on that. Duh. But I wanted to, I printed out something that, Matt, that you said during the um, episode with Dr. Sethi, and I wondered if I could just read it. It's brief. Because it really, sure. it, again, Sorry. like your song, like Believe You Me by ah, is it Zook or Zook, Zook, Zook no 22. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's on Spotify. I'm following. Not available. <laughs> uh, like, like that song, your song lyrics, they really affected me today when I was listening to it. Um, what you said in this podcast really validated some stuff for me. So I just want to read it. It's just a paragraph. You said, um, this is with Dr. Shabani Sethi. I have a lot of friends who have seen me get better on this diet, and I'm very outspoken about the fact that I attribute the bulk of my mood stability to the diet in addition with a lot of other lifestyle habits. At the same time, it seems like no one really believes me. I almost feel like I know the earth revolves around the sun and no one else does, or maybe no one cares. I have no idea. And I was listening to this in the car because I've been doing a ton of driving lately for my daughters, and I started to like tear up because... I feel like people don't take this seriously yet, you know, despite the visionaries like Dr. Palmer and you guys and your parents and, you know, Ed, everybody, Dr. Shear. I feel like I, I'm leaving out some big people, but you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, even with all that, people just are against this, you know, and you have to do, and, and you asked Dr. Sethi after you said that, you said, you said you know, how, how do you deal, how do you as a psychiatrist at Stanford deal with this, deal with the naysayers and stuff? And she, I liked what she said. She said, it's one patient at a time and you just have to, you basically have to just keep plugging away and you have to just, she just has to deal with it. And it's not all bad. There's people who do believe her, uh, you know, the, the, the neuro, the neuro, neurologist, <laughs> never can say that word, you know, there's um, heavy hitters and that's what we have to do is we just have to keep going with this. And I, you know, I don't know what else to do. And, you know, thank you for reading that. One of the, the other things I've thought about is that, like I've said before, my roommates see me do a lot of other healthy stuff. So they don't know the impact that the diet has had. And you know, there are other places where the diet might be applicable, like eating disorders, like very controversial mm -hmm. substance abuse, where people have just, you know, psych psychology is the fix and talk therapy and Freudian stuff. And this is what people want to do. And this is where the, the funding for the research goes. Mm -hmm. um, for me, if, it, if when we see people on the podcast who have recovered and when I hear testimonies, testimonials from people who have said, look, I did this diet, my entire life changed. It's worth it. You know, I try to focus on that more than mm, people who right. don't care or have a negative opinion about the diet or whatever it happens to be. But also, I think the next five to 10 years, when you have something that works, unquestionably works as well as metabolic intervention, maybe not for everyone, maybe not as right. well for everyone, but certainly better than a lot of meds in some instances, in a lot of instances, there's mm. no question that the next five, 10, 20 years, this is going to explode. You know, yeah. this is going to explode. Yeah. And there are so many, there are so many questions and issues that psychiatrists and other professionals were, will raise like, oh, you're not going to get people to adhere to a diet like this. Well, Ian and I have seen dozens, if not hundreds of people with wow. severe mental illnesses adhere to this diet, including myself, including right. many others. So we've seen evidence that people can right. do it. Um, 
So and we're I'm, motivated. I'm we're motivated, right? Motivated. I mean, yeah. it's our whole life. If people are not in our shoes who, who don't have the experiences of depressions, everything that we've had, they're not going to have that fire, you know, burning to get them to try anything that's relatively, you know, that's safe. You know, we're not going to go be like lemmings and jump off a cliff. Right. But and that's why I, and people have seen me at Manic before. My husband actually was, I've been really kind of keeping it down around him because when he sees me so excited about something, it triggers in him the times when I was indeed Manic. Um, but now he, you know, he's been really supportive about my coming onto your podcast. He knows how to, how influential both of you have been in my life. Uh, and no, I'm not going to start, you know, singing a Celine Dion song here, but <laughs> yeah, the bipolar cast has was absolutely a huge part in my going for this and staying with it. So I'm so happy that you guys went out on a limb. I know Ian, you weren't thrilled about telling people you had bipolar disorder at first and you probably, it's not something you really want to tell people even now, but, but thank uh, you for doing uh, that. Thank you. Because Sorry. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, thank you. No, thank you. I mean, the, the reason so the, one of the things that really motivates me is we get emails from people that are doing this and, and their lives are completely transformed. And, and we're now getting them almost two times a week. Wow. Uh, emails from people that are. And, and so we have to. But I mean, and this is people voluntarily doing it. We're not sort of uh, we always say you must do this with a psychiatrist and a dietitian. Um, and most of these people are doing this the right way. They're getting a psychiatrist on board and a dietitian, and they um, say that it's you know transformed a lot. And this is over quite long time periods as well. But but we're now we're building the evidence base through the pilot trial. We're presenting our preliminary results at this Metabolic Mind conference, and I, I wish I could. I really wish I could share them yeah. because they they touch on so many of these topics. But we're showing through brain scans, through metabolomics, through oh, wow. detailed uh, psychiatric questionnaires, and we're also showing in a questionnaire survey that's in the links to this description if anyone wants to fill it out. And we have um, already eighty three approaching. We're trying to reach a hundred people uh, that are doing this, and and the the things people are reporting are just. You know, if you do a questionnaire for bipolar disorder, people rush through it in five minutes and try to get it done and then get on with their day. There's people mm -hmm. writing paragraphs mm -hmm. of text about what this is doing for them. And so wow. it, it's really quite remarkable. It's a 40, it's a 30 or 40 minute questionnaire. And, and they're really descriptive of, of the kind of things that, that, that have been described in this podcast. So I, ju I just wanted to say that, you know, please don't be discouraged uh, because there, there are people that are generating the kind of solid research and evidence that will help uh, psychiatrists and family to understand this. Um, in terms of um, going forward with ketogenic diet, how um, do, what do you see as the future of uh, ketogenic diet in your daily life? Do you see it as something where you will continue to do the 85% high fat diet? And, uh, uh, and, and what is the kind of, what are you looking at next with um, Denise Potter? She's one of the world's ketogenic experts. Um, uh, have you got plans of how to uh, adapt this in the future or? Oh, totally, totally. I, I need I need Denise. I've only met with her once, but I do want to have her fine tune what I'm doing. And I wish everyone could meet with her because she's so down to earth and and helpful. But I was going to say, um, you know, for vegans, it's not that that big of, de of a deal as long as you have. And I don't work for any of these companies. OK, yeah, B12, you take B12. It's like under 10 bucks. Uh, and then this is, I don't know if it's okay to show brand, but you just get a good like keto electrolyte. Mm. <laughs> uh, that way you don't have to worry if you're getting the right electrolytes or not. And then finally a multivitamin blah, blah. and uh, omega threes. This is the biggest splurge, but it is really worth it to get your vegan omega threes. Um, I, to answer your question, I totally am, I'm so motivated to stick with this. I mean, I, I feel like the longer I stick with it, the, um, you know, maybe my sleep will get better. You know, eight months isn't that long in a way to change your whole biochemistry. And, and maybe there's just one other thing I'll bring into this mix that would tweak things. If I keep the base of the ketogenic, vegan ketogenic diet going, like as my bedrock, can you tell I live with a geologist? <laughs> my foundation. Um, I, I feel so much better doing this than I have since I got diagnosed. I feel more like the me, the me before I was diagnosed with the mood disorder. And to me, that's priceless and no one's gonna, no one's gonna stop me now. <laughs> mm. I'm, I'm, I'm on a mission. <laughs> 
it, it's something a lot of people I've spoken to have said. Um, and I, again, I really wish I could share some travel because it'd be really helpful. But in general, um, you're close. Uh, the, yes, <laughs> but, uh, but the um, but yeah, the, the, you know, you you can remember almost what you were like before you got ill when you were a kid. And a lot of people say that it's like I've not felt this way since I was a child. It was like I was. I feel like, oh, this is what I used to feel like when I felt normal as a kid. And I've definitely experienced that. It's, it's um, And it's that kind of oh. major shift and decline that people go through, in their, especially in the teenage years and the 20s. And it, it seems to uh, reverse that. And we, we also heard from, I was at a conference, um, it was a PhD conference a couple of days ago in Edinburgh. And David Unwin was speaking out here, does type 2 diabetes and uh, oh. uses oh, yeah. to reverse yeah. that. And he was saying that, um, you know, there's there's really he's reversing type two diabetes in about fifty percent of his patients now, which is remarkable. And the and the fight and the the remaining percentage are having significant improvements. And he, he said there's definitely a dynamic where the the more time spent in ketosis, there can be really ongoing benefits. And we've seen that in epilepsy, seizure reduction can happen over a year or two years. Um, so that it's really worth. Oh. You know, yeah, it, it can take a significant amount of time for the brain to repair itself, but everyone has a different brain and it, they respond differently. But it, it can be beneficial ongoing. And I've noticed that over time, the, the benefits can compound and uh, because you're you're just providing an environment for the brain to heal itself. So, yeah, that, that does make uh, complete sense uh, that, that you could experience ongoing and improving benefits. Um, some people just are completely cured. They can come off the diet uh, with epilepsy. Not, I don't think very, very many, but uh, I wish I was one of those people. I have to stay on it all the time. Uh, but it, it does yeah. happen as well. So, yeah, you, you guys, yeah. for me right now, this is the equal. This is March 20th when we're filming. Right. This. this is right. the equinox. This is when I always went manic. This is when I yeah. always went psychotic. For me, coasting through this season, taking 2.5 Zyprexa in the evening, which is super low. I mean, I used to take 20, yeah. 30 in the hospital, you know, so yeah. much. And then having that reserve, but not need, not having to take it. And every day I wake up and this is the other thing. I'm convinced that the season has some effect on my mood, regardless of the, so I ha the illness. So I have mm -hmm. a ton of energy. Mm -hmm. I have, I'm enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. I'm doing all these projects, going to work. And every day I'm like, so occasionally I have these thoughts where I'm like, Matt, you got a ton of energy right now. It's late March. Like what's going on? And then I look mm -hmm, at my mm -hmm. sleep log for my aura ring and I slept oh. nine and a half hours. I slept from 10 oh to God. seven or 10 to seven 30. And I'm like, this is crazy. And wow. so a one, one thing I would also tell people <laughs> the, the bipolar ones who tend to go manic, who tend to go psychotic is for me, mm -hmm. having the tracker and the sleep tracker is so important because then if I have a ton of energy and a ton of enthusiasm mm -hmm. and I'm talking, maybe talking more than usual or whatever it is because of the season, because I have something going on, which I think is normal human behavior. I right. can look at my sleep. I can be like, wow, I have a ton of energy right now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I slept, I'm on a low carb diet and I slept nine hours the last five nights. So let's go live life and let's have a good time. So for me, that's so important because like you, I always have those doubts. I don't want to seem too enthusiastic or too talkative right. or too gregarious uh, around people who are familiar with my history. And I think it's unfortunate, but at the same time, yeah. when I had logged the sleep, then it gives me a little bit more freedom. You can start logging my sleep. It helps me, it helps me a lot. <laughs> You're right. There's, there can be like really healthy variation of the scenes as well. Of course, every human should have more energy in the spring so they can go out and do the things that you need to do. And in the winter, you would have less animals experience that everyone. So it makes complete sense. And uh, I think um, mm. uh, Daniel Smith, who I work with, is a uh, professor of psychiatry. He, he published mm -hmm. a paper saying that bipolar is actually an adaptive condition in natural conditions. So if you're if you're in a natural day night cycle and you're in nature and mm -hmm. you're not exposed to all the stresses of modern life, you would actually experience this really uh, positive lift in energy, but it wouldn't go up beyond the normal bounds. But mm -hmm. when you're exposed to like the circadian disruption and the food and the everything, this thing that can be beneficial actually becomes destructive. But I've, I've experienced that in ketosis, you experience just a, a, a healthy natural variation in when there's a, the spring, you feel, you know, like you want to go outside and do things, but it's not manic and it's not, you're not going into these uh, heightened states. So, mm -hmm. so I think, mm -hmm. I think, we can benefit from the just the way we are naturally uh, in ketosis, but without the, the the destructive elements. Do you notice the seasonal shift and change, Dan, as well? Oh yes, yeah. yeah. In fact, it's yeah. I mean, my birthday was over the weekend, so I'm kind of coming. I didn't get get too crazy over that, but um, I. So this is like a special time for me, anyway. But but I can definitely 
it makes me happier, you know, but it's, it's good. It's not, it's not, I believe me, I know when it starts to spiral and um, I love, I love the change of the seasons. So I do notice a change. And, uh, yeah, and, change. And, and any healthy human should. And it's, um, so it's, uh, it's, yeah. Really it's, it's, yeah. And it's fantastic because the, it's all tied in with circadian rhythm and we're doing some, uh, there's some interesting research on that, you know, happening uh, with lots of bipolar researchers that are looking at how do we harness these circadian rhythms with the seasons and and with food and with and so we're looking at things that are not just throwing pills at people, which are which right. are helpful and work, uh, but we need to look at other ways of like normalizing our environment so we can have the adaptive element of the uh, of bipolar disorder. But um, I want to be respectful of your time because we're coming up on um, <laughs> yeah. Now, but uh, I'm sure you've got lots of writing to. Um, yeah, are you working on a new book at the moment, or it's very slowly? I I started writing it, um, and it's funny because my mom. I was talking to her over the weekend. She's almost ninety years old, and she always wanted me to write like the a great novel. And she's like, she's very proud of my first book about bipolar, but she's like, I don't want you to write another book about bipolar or veganism. Mm -hmm. Little does she know. <laughs> I'm not doing about bipolar, but I'm going to write about uh, how veganism and keto and mental health can all combine to be a positive thing and not a bad thing. That, that's at least that's what I think I'm writing now. We'll see what yeah, really happens. Yeah. Awesome. I think yeah, that's an important you. message because I'm sure a lot of vegans are skeptical about keto. Yeah. Like, what am I going to eat? You know, keto yeah. seems like a, a carnivorous type diet, but we have people, and I, yeah, and people I, I, who know, show it is possible. That's also a reason I wanted to come on here because um, I know there's a lot of people who say a carnivore diet, you know, saved their lives. And I'm, I'm not out. I realize like, I can't really change other people. This, this started with my own family. When I decided to be a vegan, you just do your thing and then people see how you are and the, you just go from there. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I don't pressure people because I've learned that doesn't work at all. So, yeah. So I really appreciate having the opportunity to be here. Thanks so much for coming on. And thank uh, you so yeah. much. Yeah, and thank, thank you. You're such an important. I just want, yeah, and I just wanted to say you're such an important part of the bipolar community. Talking about your experience in this book, and thank you for doing that because it's inspiring so many people, helping so many people to understand and learn about this condition. So it's just a total honor to have you on, and we're really looking forward to your next book. Oh, and could you remind us what, what your book is so people can find it? We'll put a link sure. in the description. It's. Uh, I'll just. I know it's going to come. It's going to be backwards. Birth of a new brain. I like the title. Uh, healing from postpartum bipolar disorder it, it's not just for women it's for men and you know any other you know transgender whatever i don't know if you should edit that out do you guys edit no, <laughs> you're, you're good. no. no you're good. hey you're, i live in you're, santa you're cruz good. you know you're, you're <laughs> it's good. for you're anybody good. you're good that's fantastic please go out and check out the book and we'll put the link in the description oh. and check out matt single on uh, spotify yeah. uh zook believe you me all right. Stay safe Luke out 22. there, Santa Cruz. Have a good one. Thank bye you bye. so much. I will. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye.